then you, you, you kind of like, if a person, how many times they have to answer your model, it's, you know, those are the kind of statistical quantities. And then programming, because it's, you have to write it in, in a modular programming, a lot more, you, you have to write a lot more code to make figures, to kind of decompose, transform, you know, basically clean, compute, uh, feature importance and all that. So along these dimensions, but then there are other dimensions that you still have to do that it will contribute. For example, in, you know, you have to think about data, you have to think about the business, you have to think about, uh, you know, dockerization a little bit and kind of like setting up a pipeline if you think, but we don't ask you specifically most of them in, in the task. So that's why, because we are not going to evaluate it, it's kind of contributes less. We don't measure it as much, but of course, for you doing it, you would improve, right? And SQL programming, you know, fluency and scientific method, this is really means like, do you take understandings? Like, do you, are you scientific driven? That means that are you taking data um, as seriously? And do you kind of generate a hypothesis to test? And then you do the testing. And then are you thinking about the types of errors you're making? because of multiple things. So that's the kind of the scientific evidence-based thinking is called a scientific method. Ethics, whether, you know, doing something uh, is ethical or not, you know, some of them we don't specifically ask and you might not be thinking, that's why we put them like as more marginal contribution, while statistical and critical thinking because analyzing and infer inference basically in general, it's called, that means you get the data, you get the plots, you get, you analyze, and then you make inference. So that's that really requires statistical and critical thinking. Software engineering and dev environment definitely you have to set up. You should be, um, you know, you have to use Git and all that. So that's, and of course, most of it is not covered. The tutorials only cover small. So there's this impact in lifelong learning, but it contributes. You have to learn a lot by yourself. That's why it kind of contributes, um, you know, it's kind of uh, significant. And then all that. Okay. So you have to pay attention to the key bits because they are very, very important. It's like, you know, that we really take submission dates and stuff very seriously. Um, unlike the week zero, there, are, there won't be an extension um, this time because this is very well defined for the 12 weeks. You have to get used to it that there will be two submissions um, and so the, the discussion is now, whatever I think, but the, like the interim solution is like you have to submit on Wednesday by this time. And there is like late policy that you have to read and this is the final submission. Leaderboard for the, the week will be updated. Uh, and then it is kind of the way that we assign elements or values to each of your activities is listed here for the community related, like all your, whatever you, how you ask, how you participate, how you help other people, how you get help it what kind of questions, what kind of resources you post. And all of that is kind of really, we take it serious and it has really a major point, 20 points. And then also we ask you presentation reporting. In this case, it's just that you have to prepare slides. And then each has like uh, the entry and submissions that you have to your intent um, and your understanding in the entry and your full final uh, compilation uh, that has 15 points. And then the dashboard, that you would build uh, the screenshot that you would attach that has only just, it's only at the end that you are required to do that. And this has 20 points as well, that if you manage to just at least get, make it work in your computer, uh, then you get, and then you can attach screenshot, uh, screenshot and then uh, attach the code that you will get half the point and then if you are able to at least make a Docker file to build it in a Docker as a Docker container or that you deploy it in a Roku or anywhere else that, that can be accessed, then you get the other half point, okay? And then the rest is made up of uh, data analysis and coding because this is the major part. That's why it cares a lot. But we really care in this case that you do very well. You are able to answer some of the questions in the task that you do the pre-processing and the EDA, you generate insightful and quality plots, that means appropriate plots, not just only the, the thing, but you know, you kind of show us that you have been thinking and it's just like active thinking. If you do free quiet GitHub's commits, 
and if you done in multiple branching and you know pull requests you know they carry also some amount and modularity and quality of the code we gave you like the kind of a structure that you should follow you should follow it and then the, in the final this was the end stream and the final again um, you have you know major point is carried by that and so the sum of that would put you in the so what ranks you in the leaderboard as well as also what we consider you know best performance uh, it accumulates right so that it's translated as a competency so whoever cons you know get does best work here basically in that competency map they get the maximum movement so uh, that means like you started with a certain base value and we require a certain amount in of competency and each of the tasks like uh, would in increase different values uh, across different dimensions of the competency as i said for the major ones would be the maximum shift you can have and therefore um, the, the values that you score here are what mm -hmm. contributes to that so if you get the best value then you move up the best basically or farther in that in that um, in that competency there are badges that uh, every week we are we give so this is more of honor like and recognizing what you have done um, so like for example who comes up with a very novel and quality visualization will get the badge of uh, you know visualization so that's kind of your honor it also carries a little uh, value but it's more more it's just to recognize that you have done really well and you kind of spend your time and you know or you're gifted in that area and the kind of the person who does high quality code who kind of uh, does that they get the quality of code badge and if the person who's kind of comes up with innovative approach to analysis we get the innovative approach analysis and the person who, who did really presented well or who, who prepared a good report or a slide gets the writing and presentation badge and then the person who was most helpful or who were kind of active and who engaged the community would get most supportive in the community badge this is an individual work so uh, you can work like you know you can uh, collaborate but you have to work you know on your own and you have to submit your own work um, and in late policy just read it so there is kind of a little bit tolerance but not much so it's basically you really if you submit one day after you basically get nothing um, that's the point and then in the instructions i hope this is clear what is needed to expect um, you know some of them are kind of like as you say like in the submissions that you are that shown above what you need to submit is clear but if you can demonstrate further that's also taken into account but it's as i said a lot of them is kind of um is to help you get that structure um so yeah try as much as you want but the real focus is like demonstrate your analysis your kind of understanding of this this data um through basically uh, data exploration and visualization so there are four tasks i think these are very clear so it's like the one the data is uh, telecommunication data and you kind of have to do four types of analysis to, to to arrive to your conclusion one is the kind of the overview analysis that you do uh, over every data that you have but then there are other like the user engagement part. So you look at just only the, the engagement and the users kind of, um, you split the data basically in that sense and, and kind of drive some quantities uh, based on their engagement. And then the user has experience with this teleco. That means like whether satisfied, not satisfied, you know, a lot of quantities along that level. And so you, you would also kind of split the data and look at it in this form of experience. And then at the same, so that's their experience, like, you know, ups and downs, the connection, all that, you will, you will figure it out. And the other part is like, whether that's, they are satisfied with that, which means, which also you will drive some insights uh, from the data on that level. So it's derived in that because these are combined, will give you a very broad experience. Of course, a very a user, users, most users with a good experience who are engaging and are highly satisfied definitely will be able to you know uh, keep going and so the churn rate and stuff will be smaller and therefore uh, you know the company if you buy it 
will be more profitable. On the other side, it will probably recommend it differently, right? So it's kind of that making up. So you're trying to make up your mind, but by looking at this overall um, um, kind of analysis, okay? The early variables are clear. What in the interim submissions you have to you have to add? It's, we made it as, as clear as possible, but if it's not clear, you can still ask. And in the final submission, uh, what also you have to submit? And then the references that you can do. Hopefully that's clear. If it's not clear, you can ask um, and discuss. Um, but now I will just I assume that it's clear. And if you have one or two questions, you can ask. Otherwise, I will hand it over to the tutorial session to Abu Bakr. Thank you very much, Jim. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. How are we all doing? Okay, so uh, first tutorial session for today will be covering the data cleaning, uh, data extraction, and uh, data transformation using Mozilla code uh, with Python. Right. All right. So the data and the notebook has been shared in the folder here. Yeah, so this is the notebook that I'm going to be using for vulnerability sake. I'm going to be starting this place. Okay, I'm sure you will have access to it. And the data I'm going to use is not the same data that you are going to be working with, so don't confuse it. You don't have access to this data. This is just for the tutorial sake and then to teach you what the, how to do data cleaning, transforming, and extraction. Okay? If you have um, any questions, do ask in the in chat, and then I'll get back to it to see it. Okay? All right. Thank you. So, from what we have, uh, data cleaning is one of the essential steps towards making real meaning of any data sets. It makes the data ready for modeling and uh, analysis. So here we'll be learning how to do uh, data cleaning. I'm going to be using the pandas and the NumPy library specifically for the uh, cleaning of my notebook of my data. As you know, pandas is the uh, library that is used for data manipulation and transformation. And while NumPy is used for numerical um, analysis, you might use a little bit of NumPy for data generation. And then in the next cell, I am importing one is just to silence the warnings because um, because of some issues. So, and then the data has a lot of columns. So I'm using this particular line to so I'm, I'm using line um, three here to increase the width of the screen such that, uh, let's say, I'm just confirming this again. Okay. Okay. All right, all done. All right, is it better now? Can you all see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let's continue. So I'm using the set option to increase the width of the column that is being displayed. And here, I can see all of the columns that I have in my data set. And then checking the column list with this particular fold. I have encounter ID, patient, race, gender, age, weight, and a host of many other uh, columns. Specifically, we are putting this data just to um, clean it. We can see from the head method, we have a lot of missing values in the wage. We also have some missing values in some of these columns here, and then we're going to be um, treating some ways that we can fix uh, all of this. There are about um, 100,000 uh, 100, 
uh, 100, and then oh, there it is, 101,766 rows and uh, 50 columns in the data set. And these are, so, these are all the columns that are present in the data set. This link here will take you back to the to the future description of the, the data that you are going to be working with for this challenge. And then, so the first stage of any data cleaning is to undo missing values. And then, as you can see from the add method that I defined earlier, you can see we have a lot of missing values, and then we're going to be dealing with them. So this function takes in the data frame, and then it returns the percentage of the missing values in the data set. From the execution of this function, we get about 7.35 percent missing. So it's not a lot, but is the missing values and then we need to deal with it on a column wise uh, level of looking at uh, which column has the missing values so we have the um, db dot so i write the data with the db so it's now dot sum which means that uh, in race we have about 2273 missing values the weight we have about 98,569 missing values and that's a lot and then a lot of other columns without missing value and some with some other missing value okay so i'm going to be explaining some method at which you can deal with this um so fixing missing values is a crucial part of any data science machine learning project because you might be making the data better by your method or otherwise so depending on how you decide to fix the missing value you might be making the data better or you might just be um complicating the matter, right? You might be adding more complexity to the data, depending on the method that you use. So there are a lot of methods that you can use to fix missing values in your data set. So your decision on how, on the method you choose to use has to be perfect or close enough. How would you know which uh, method would suit a particular uh, missing, um, I mean, a column with a missing value in your data set? You have to like explore what the data is saying and then understand that this particular column names that belongs to this particular data type, and this is how you're supposed to fix it, okay? Uh, the rule of thumb is for all object data type, kind of column or feature, use the mode method to fill that. So I'm going to be showing you how to use the mode method to fill it. And then if it is a number kind of um, column, and then you should use the mean or the median method. Now the question is, um, how would you decide if you're supposed to use the mean or the median method? And then the simple answer to that would be if the column, after your um, simple analysis, you found out that the column is Q, then it is advised that you use the median and not the mean. What do I mean by skewed? We are going to be seeing an example very soon. Uh, so if it is skewed, then you should use the median and not the mean. And the major reason why you are using the uh, median and not mean is because mean is highly susceptible to um, skew data. A data, a skew data is a data where uh, that has outlier. There is extremely high value or extremely low value in the data set, and then that's why it is skewed. And that is why we need to fill with the median and not the mean. Okay. Another method that we can use to fill um, missing values is using the fill forward method or the uh, backward fill method. We're going to be seeing some examples of how to fix this as well. Um, you also need to consider what the column represents before you fill missing values. Uh, so, um, for example, if, if a column, uh, if you, uh, for instance, the, the age column has a missing value, you don't just want to start uh, filling with the mode just because it's uh, just because it's the age column, you need to understand that it's the age column, and then age is supposed to be something that is. Uh, all number and integer kind of data type are not some floats because it is not technically possible for you to be 10.9 years old, right? You can only be 10 years old or 11 years old. There is a people with 10 years, 11 months, but no. In our case, it's better to just be uh, 10 years or 11 years and not 10.2 years. It doesn't make one sense. Um, another easy way to do this is you can just decide to drop all of the missing rules. But the problem is, if you have about 99% missing values, and then you just drop all of them, then you don't have any data left for analysis or model. So you need to like figure out ways to um, look for what to, I mean, method that you can use to fill the missing value. From the results of this query, uh, we know weight 
That's about uh, 98,569 missing values in about uh, 101,766. Yeah? So that's a lot of missing values, yeah? a lot of them. So that is why weight is one of the columns that is being dropped here. So this is how I drop the columns with more than 30% missing values. I'm going to be showing you a function that you can use to calculate um, the number of missing values as well as the percentage of the missing values in the column. Okay. So weight has more than 30% missing value. That's why it's been dropped. The same thing applies to the payer code, medical specialty, max clue serum, and A1. Um, A1C results. Okay, and that's why I am dropping them, setting the axis to the first one because I'm going to drop them column wise and not row wise. And then we have about 45 columns left after I'm dropping it, and we still have our entire um, data points. Okay, now as I've said earlier, we're going to be using some uh, modular coding to uh, fix some of the issues that are present in this data set, and one of them is missing values, right? So um, I have already explained that some method that you can use to fill missing value is the um, fill forward method or the backward fill method. This is how we use the fill forward method. Uh, I've defined a function called fix missing value using the fill forward method. All you have to do is call the um, data frame on the column that you want to um, that you want to fill the missing value, and then use the fill any method, and then you pass in the uh, method at which you want to use to fill the missing value to be FFILL, -L, which stands for forward fill. Okay, and then the other method is fix missing using the backward fill method, and then this is DFILL. -L. What fill forward method does is if you have a column called, uh, uh, let's see, which column? All right, uh, let me just take a column to show you. So if you have this column, the speak. Ah, I'm not run this. Okay, I should probably just run it so I don't run into errors. Right. It's a space. You had a space in your column. Okay, thank you. But I have no time. And you see it on this, and then on this. Yeah, okay. Oh. It didn't generate what I wanted, but nonetheless. So if we're going to be using the forward fill method, if for instance, this particular row has missing value, and then it says none, um, the forward fill method says, go to the next row and look at it if it has a value. If it has a value, then come back to the um, row that has missing value and then replace that with it. So for instance, if um, the row uh, 56,522 was missing, and then this next row has uh, a particular value. It's going to fill this missing value here with this value. That is the forward fill method. Okay, and then it's the uh, reverse is the case for the backward fill method. So if this is the um, if this row is the one that has missing value, it's just going to go one step backward and then check the row that comes before the row with the missing value, and then fill that with that value. Okay? Uh, is that clear? Do you understand that? Let me see if I have any questions. Hello, Boka. Uh, sorry about that. I just want to talk. Hello. Hello, Boka. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, I didn't catch you on the last thing, uh, the last topic you were saying, but because your sound was breaking a little bit. Okay, like what is it? Forward yeah. feeling, backward feeling. Okay. Uh, I didn't get the concept uh, really well because of sound. Alright, how do we explain it? Okay. okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Sure Alright, thank you. So what I was explaining about forward feeling and backward feeling is for the forward feel method, if let me just check it here. I get some pull up that has missing buttons. Ah. But I'm short weeks. So probably not need to fix it. Okay. So what I was explaining about forward field method is for the forward field method, if for instance, yeah, for instance, the row two column I and mean, the row two for the column ex, um, examined is missing, and then we're using the forward field method to fill the missing value. What the method will do is it will leave, it will identify that row two is missing, and then it will come one row ahead of row two, which is row three, and then looks for a value there. If a value exists in row three, it will take that value and then fill the missing value in row two with that value. That is what the forward fill method will do. Okay? And then the backward fill method will, instead of coming a step ahead of the row with the missing value, it will go back uh, one step and then fill the missing value. So still using the same scenario, row two is missing, and then instead, instead of the forward field method, which will come uh, one step ahead, it will go one step backward and go to row one, and then take the value from row one, if it exists, and then fill the missing value with that. Okay? Do you understand that? Is it clear? Uh, yeah, it's clear, but what if the next field doesn't have, like, if it doesn't so, exist? Uh, so like, if, if row two, a row two is missing, yeah? So if it is missing and then row one is also missing and then row zero is also missing, which means there is no uh, method, I mean, there is no value to fill it, and then it still remains now. It will not fill it because that's reached the, uh, the last point of it. So it will not fill it, okay? But so it like, will continue, yeah? So like if uh, we are using forward filling method and yes. uh, row two is the one we want to fill and row if there is row four, will it go to row four or just check row three and fill men? Okay, so what it will do is it will keep searching for a particular row that has a value if you are using the forward fill method, okay? And until it finds a particular value to fill it with, it will still keep checking that particular row. So if there's no value in any of the row that all of it is missing, then it will not fill it with um, anything. It's still replaced. I mean, it's still none. Okay, so it will keep checking. It's not just on a simple, I mean, it's not one level kind of checking. It checks the entire row until there's no more um, data points in the column. Okay, it's clear. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on backward filling and forward filling? Uh, Michael, you are raising your hand? Okay. Is it clear now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have a question. I think I have two questions. Um, okay. With what you said, for, for the backward and then the forward fill. So assuming row zero, if we are using a backward fill, and then row zero is empty, where does it start from? That's my first question. And then um, with what you just said, if you have two consecutive rows which have missing values, then it means that if the if um, the filling process goes is just one iteration, but it does not go over and over, then it means there would still be missing values after uh, putting in the function to uh, uh, fill the missing values. I don't know if you get my question right. Well, yes, I, I get your question. So okay. that's what Those are the two uh, questions yeah. I have. Thank okay, you. Thank you. So, um, your second question is similar to what um, Berkett has uh, asked. So, it does not just check the next row after it identifies a missing um, row. It keeps checking until um, the, it sees a value to fill it with. And then, given that we still have a um, data point, it will still, keep, uh, to still check the um, entire row. Okay? So, it does not just check. So, as remember, row 2 is missing. It does not just check row 3 and then look for a value. It is, if it does not have any value, then it stops there. It keeps checking until it finds a, um, a value, 
and then if it finds the value it keeps filling it that particular way backward 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 until it fills the missing values okay that's the uh, second question for the first question if uh row zero is missing and then we are using the backward fill uh, method then there is nothing ahead of row zero to check yeah so it still remains nine. I hope I answered both of the questions. Yeah, I, I, I get I get the answer well, but the question the situation is if that is the case, then it means that after using the uh, fill in, um, fill NA with back fill, backward fill or forward flow, there's still a possibility that you still have missing values in your um, process data. Yes, of course. You you see, I think you see a similar case once we start, uh, like when we go a little bit further, you see a similar case like that. So you still like, need to cross check the method to be sure that it has actually worked the way you expect it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, what is the advantage of filling with backward fill and forward fill? Um, the specific, the major advantage is that um, you don't fill with an arbitrary value that you are introducing to the data. So for instance, if you decide to fill with the mode or the mean or the median, you are the one creating that um, value for yourself. So it's not like it exists in the data before. So that's just the um, the difference between, I mean, the advantage of backward field and um, forward field. Okay, so you are still filling with the data that already exists in the um, column, which is likely to be the actual value. Okay, that's just the uh, advantage. Um, is it a whole replacement or it repeats the value of the next column? It repeats the value of the next row, not the uh, column. You know, you have to target the color that you want to fill. So it replicates the value of the next row and not the color. Um, and so we at least get in the low performing model, especially if it has a lot of principle. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And that's the, one of the disadvantages of using the backward field and the forward field method. Okay, that's the disadvantage. And then we choose the type of billion to use. Um, like I said earlier, you like need to understand what the data is all about, what that colon is saying, and then it will help you to choose which method you are supposed to use. And as you know, digital science, pro I mean, digital science projects is an uh, an iterative process. And then if you try the backward view method and then you do the model, you notice it's not as good as you want. You might want to change the method to probably forward view method or using the mean or the median. So like you can iterate and choose which one works best for you. There's not like a, a rule that says you have to use this method to fill this particular problem. No, because we have different data sets for different kinds of problems and then you need to use different methods to you know, solve different kinds of problems. Okay, uh, what percentage of the data needs to be null for okay. okay, so the, my rule, which I, I'm not sure if like it's generally, um, um, Taking it to, uh, I don't know. But my rule is that if it is more than 30%, like if the missing value is more than 30%, then the data might just be as good as uh, not being present in the data, in the entire data set. So I'll, I'll like just drop the column. So if it's more than 30%, I'll drop it. There's no need for me to like build that kind of missing value because I'll be introducing ambiguity of uh, like 30% ambiguity to my data, which in most cases might work and then in other cases might just be the one causing uh, limitations to your data set, okay? So you might like want to drop it out. And then if you decide to drop them, you can still like come back and add it and fill with missing values and see if it improves your method. If it does not, then you can like drop them. Because if you drop, if you have less volume to train your data weight uh, as well, it might help um, to train your model faster and then it might give you better accuracy. And then if you are training with 1000 kind of data, I mean, Columns and then you are still getting similar accuracy when you use seven um, columns. Then what's the essence of training with a lot of columns? Okay, so that's why. Uh, among the methods to deal with missing values, which one is market? Um, depends on the problem that you have. There's nothing like uh, this one is the most accurate, this one is not. But what has worked for many people is using the median for the uh, for numerical kind of data and then using the mode for the categorical kind of data. And uh, if the data is not, um, is, if the data does not contain outlier, then you can, if the data does not contain outlier and then it's numerical, which is most cases, then you can fill with mean or the median. But the general rule is that median always kind of work and then mode always kind of work for um, categorical kind of data. 
Thank you. I have answered a lot of these questions. Can I get to Hello? yes to proceed? Yes. Go. Yeah, I have a follow up question to Michael's question. Um, can we uh, use like the forward fill and backward fill in the same um, column such that if the first row is null, it will know to use forward fill, and if the last row is null, it will know to use backward fill. Can you like put both methods? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get your question. It's kind of great. Okay, when we're filling the null values, yeah. can we mix both back, back fill and forward fill in the same um, code such that if the first row is null, it will know to use forward fill, and if the last row is null, it will know to use the backward fill. Yes. Is it possible? Yeah, I mean, it is possible. So you can apply the forward fill method to a particular column and still come back and apply the backward fill to that same column. Yes, you can. It's can can it happen in the same line of code where you put two methods? Uh, fill any method goes to forward fill, and then dot fill any method is yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, today I will share my screen. I mean, I'm sharing my screen. I'll just go back to the report. I'm just like to be able to read uh, some of the questions. Uh, remove language contains this value. Is it a good method? Yes, it's a good method depending on the size of your data and then the kind of question you're trying to answer or the kind of problem you're trying to solve. Okay. And then if, for instance, you have like 15%, of the column or yeah of the of a particular column is missing so you can like drop all of that rows of that missing value it might be able to like take care of some other um, columns that have missing value as well so it's it's a good idea to drop them if your data set is much yeah it's big and then you have uh, just a, a few of them that is missing please you can drop them so if you have like one missing data point in like one thousand um rows you can you can remove it there's nothing for you to introduce ambiguity just remove that and then turn with the remaining area 99. thank you very much um any questions ah, okay so we'll just go back to the code yes okay thank you very much uh okay so this is uh so from the question that um uh, kate has asked so you you can like use forward view method and then still use a uh, backward fill method okay so it's it's just going to be something like this then something like this actually yes. and then you just do fill na and then it match up to be equals to not sure i got the spelling correct i think it is B F I L N. okay and then this should like fix the missing value all right so what this means is you are trying with forward fill method first and then if there is any other missing value then use the backward field method to do that. Basically, that's what you have done. Okay? All right. Not sure I want these codes. Okay. And uh, that is that for the, uh, for dealing with missing values in our uh, data set. Up next is the transforming our data. So other missing columns can be fixed based on your uh, understanding. You can decide to drop of fill using appropriate method, whichever you decide, you have to like explain your reasons. So in the data that you are currently, yeah, you are going to be using for this project, for this week project, there are missing values, of course. And then if you decide to fill with forward fill or backward fill, you should be able to state the reason why you're using this method and not this method, okay? And then for you to choose, for you to be like right in the method that you have chosen, you have to like understand what that particular column is all about, what it is saying, and that's how you can fill it. Okay, uh, I'm using the um, forward fill method to fix all of this, and this is how I use the mode to fill missing values. So, race is a categorical column. Okay, this is it. Race is a categorical column, uh, Caucasian, kind of American. So, I can't, I, I can decide to fill forward fill or backward fill, but for the sake of experimenting, um. I'm using the mode method to fill with it. And then when it says, I'm still using the fill ND method. And then in the in the method, I'm like using my own method here. I'm saying calculate the mode for this column and then give me the value. Because when you calculate, let me show you. 
when you calculate uh, when you calculate the mode this is what you get so you get zero caucasian okay so you need to like if you if i go this way and then i don't subset it the way i've done here then i'm going to like get an error saying that um you can't fill with uh in a series so i have to like subset it so that i can get the actual value and then when i do this i get the caucasian so that's how it's going to like replace all the missing value with this particular value okay and then as you know mode is like the most occurring value in a particular uh, color and then it happens that caucasian is the most occurring value in the race code okay uh transforming data in our transforming i mean transforming the data we have a lot of methods that we can use and then scikit-learn is like it, it provides all of these methods for us there are other methods that we can use in in my in our simple tutorial here we're going to be talking about um scaling and then normalization there are two different things um uh, scaling uh so let me read what I one of the reasons that it's easy to get confused between scaling and normalization is because the terms are sometimes used interchangeably. So you might have attended a seminar where they keep using scaling and normalization, and then essentially what they are trying to illustrate is the scaling method and not normalization method, because there exists a simple difference between them, okay? Uh, so to make it even more confusing, they are very similar because they practically do uh, the same thing, or not in uh, or uh not in all uh sense okay why is it dropping okay so you are transforming the values in both cases of scaling and normalization you will be transforming the values of numerical value variables so that the transform data points are specific every properties the difference is in scaling you are changing the range of your data the range of your data, as you know, range is like the uh, maximum and the minimum. And uh, in normalization, you are changing the shape of the distribution of your data. As you know, in uh, in uh, particular data, when you plot it, you can have either a Gaussian distribution or a less skewed kind of data or a Laplace kind of data and then the rest. Okay. Uh, so in what this what scaling means is like you are transforming your data so that it fits within a specific scale. So it could be the scale could be between zero and hundred or zero to one. So you want to scale data when you are using methods based on um, measures of how far apart data points are. So for instance, a support vector machine, which happens to be an algorithm, or a key nearest neighbors, which is another um, algorithm. These these two algorithms that has been mentioned here uses uh, how, um, the the distance of a particular data point from another data point of a particular row to like compute or make decisions about what they are supposed to do. Probably this belongs to this class or the next class. Okay. So we are not supposed to like delve into the details of support vector machines and key nearest neighbors. You can like read more about them. Okay. So with these algorithms, a change of one in any numeric feature is given the same importance. And that might not be the case for a, a, a particular column with uh, with a different scale. So that's why we need to like scale them and bring them to the same um, to the same scale. Okay. For example, you might be looking at the prices of some products in both yen and US dollars. As you know, yen and US dollars are not the same thing. Yeah. So one US dollar is what about 100 yen? Uh, but if you don't scale your prices, uh, methods like support vector machine or key nearest neighbors will consider a difference in price of one yen as important as a difference of one US dollar, which is not the case. Because if you if you see a product for two US dollar and then you see another product for um, 200 yen, they are not the same thing. Yeah, They, they are very different. Okay, And that's what um, scaling is trying to like illustrate. So this clearly doesn't fit with our intuition of the world because they are not the same thing. So with currency, you can convert between currencies, okay? But what about if you are looking at something like height and weight? So height and weight can, can be measured in different um, uh, measurement scale. So it's not entirely clear how many pounds should equal one inch. 
or how many kilograms should equal one meter. They are different. And that's what um, scale allows us to do. It allows us to bring all of these colors into the same scale, and then we can uh, apply the same algorithm on them, and then the algorithm will be, will be able to make uh, good driven decisions about them because we have scaled them. An example, I'm going to be using the min max scalar from the pre-processing um, method of the SKLN library. What this min max does is it takes the, the mathematical explanation is um, the actual value minus the minus the mean of that particular column divided by uh, the um, the maximum minus the minimum. Okay, I think I missed this. The actual value. Let me write it down. So the formula is the actual value minus the, the maximum of that column, then divide by the maximum. That's pull up minus the minimum of that way. So this is the um, this is the mathematical explanation behind the max scalar. Okay, so so I'm using that. I'm initializing this particular class here, just like you you would initialize um, your class when you define it in Python. So I'm initializing this, and then the uh, the, the variable name max scalar now has access to all of the um, Methods that are present in Minmax scalar here. Okay, so I'm creating a synthetic data from the random um, module of the NumPy library, and then I'm using the exponential. The scale is 200, and then the size is 2000. And then when I run this code, this is what the value looks like. This is just sample. This is this are what the value looks like. Uh, you can read more about NumPy random exponential function as you get how it works. But this will generate about 2,000 uh, data points. The maximum, that we, I mean, the minimum that we have is uh, 0 0.09, and then the maximum is 1,612. And then when we plot it using the uh, bin size to the plus to 14, this is what the data looks like. Okay? This is what the data looks like. So you could see that and there are lots of value that range between 0 to 200. In this case, it's in the value distribution. This is an histogram chart, which is not new. And then I'm trying to apply the scalar, the scaling method onto the um, data. Okay. So I have defined a function, I call it scalar, and then it takes in the um, data frame. I'm saying um, by scale data to be equals to Vmax scalar that I defined here. Vmax scalar, and then I'm using the fit transform method on that data frame, okay? The fit transform method would go into the data, understand the kind of data points that we have there, and then it applies that uh, that scaling method onto it, okay? So it applies this formula onto it. That's what the fit transform does. That's what scikit-learn gives us. It gives us all of the methods in a fit transform kind of fashion, where we can fit, which means we are learning, and then transform, which means we are applying, okay? And then I am creating uh, a subplot of uh, okay. a subplot, two plots actually, uh, with the figure and the, the and the axis to con uh, to configure each of the plots. And then I'm setting the size to be ten by six. I'm plotting an histogram plot. I'm passing in the original data, and then I'm saying it should be the first plot, which is ax equals to um, ax of zero. And then I'm setting the title to be original data, and that's what you can see here. Excuse me. And then I'm doing the second plot, and then I'm calling it scaled. I'm, I'm passing the scale data into it, and then I'm saying it should be the second plot, and that is what you can see here. Okay, I'm setting the title as well. And then when I call the function scalar original data, original data is what I generated here. So when I, part, when I do that, this is what the data looks like, and then as you can see, similar to this, only that the bin size is different, and that's why you can see a lot of all of these things. And then when it is scaled, you can see, according to the definition of scaling, it does not actually change, I mean, it only changes the, uh, the range of your data points and not the shape, okay? And you can see the original data range from 0 to 1,500, 1, and now it's between 0 and 1. That's the default scaling method. 
in muscular and then so these are in the same scale now and then when you apply your algorithm onto them it will see them as the same thing because you have scaled them as they should be okay uh do you understand scaling Let's see uh, quality, quality or quantity. Uh, I don't. Know. You mean numbers? We, we, it's not like compulsory. For instance, if if um, okay, say for instance, you have the age column, then you have the salary column. Age column can let's say it ranges between zero to hundred, and then the salary ranges between five thousand to ten thousand. Right? The scale is already too much. Okay. And that is not how we want to like inform our data because for instance age and salary should have the same impact on our data and then we should allow our model to then decide that okay this is the one that has higher importance compared to this one okay we should not be the one informing it that, that way because if we don't like understand probably salary has more weight than the age then there is no need for us to like add code that into our code and that's why we need to like scale them bring the salary and the age into the same scale and then throw it into your model and then let your model make the decision okay that's the question for um, christian that says scaling important uh do we need to do it outlier first before we scale the data um if you scale the data you are you can't say you are dealing with the outliers yeah so even if you drop the outlier before scaling it's still the same thing and if you drop the outlier before scaling there might not be a need for scaling yeah but then, boys, like if you just kill straight away, then you have already taken care of the outliers, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. How do you deal with the dropping the rows that have outliers? Basically, that is if you identify that this row has outliers, you just drop them. You can drop them, and then that should work out well. Okay, outlier can uh, skew our data, and then you can just decide to drop them. Any other questions on scaling? Do you need to scale district numeric value? Which is looking about stocks? Uh, so when when you scale age and then it has a floating point number, your um your your the column is already uh, you already like codify what the age already means so to layman we 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 understand that age is supposed to be 12 13 14 but if you throw your age into a scaling method and then it scales it and then you get like 0 0.2 0 0.3 your uh, the, that is to you you don't understand the age now but the scaling method already understand that 70 is between 0 0.02 to 0 0.07 so it's like the age is 70 years to you and then in your scaling method says it's between 0 0.07 to 0 0.08 it's already on the standard so to layman you don't understand it again but to your uh, model you, you, it's already on the standard okay so even if you get the closing point number after scaling it's fine yeah thank you uh any other questions we can move straight to normalization Can we proceed? Thank you. All right. Uh, that is that for scaling, non normalization. So, scaling just changes the range of your data. Normalization is a more radical transformation. Ow. The point of normalization is to change your observations so that they can be described as a normal distribution if you look at this data this data is not normally distributed you will see a normally distributed data version you might be shocked but you'll see it uh normal distribution also known as bell curve so it's supposed to be bell curve by the way this is a specific statistical distribution where a roughly equal observation fall above and below the mean the mean and the median are the same or are almost the same and they are more uh, they are more observation closer to the mean so the normal distribution is also known as the gaussian distribution uh, in general you will normalize your data if you are going to use a machine learning or statistical technique that assumes your data is normally distributed 
Some examples of this include linear discriminant analysis. This is not new to many of us, and uh, I think all of us. And Gaussian naive base. Gaussian naive base also is not new to many of us because linear discriminant analysis kind of inherits from um, naive base method, and then it uses naive base method to make decisions about which topic is which. Yeah. So pretty any method with Gaussian in the name probably assumes a normal thing. Okay. So if your name kind of have Gaussian, it's kind of normal. So if you don't have Gaussian in your name, I don't know. The method you will be using to normalize here is the normalizer method from SQLED. So let's see how, how to do that. Okay. So in a for a normal distribution, it should have the bell shape and not this kind of shape. Okay, this is not bell shape. This is like a left skewed kind of data. Yeah. So I have a function called normalizer. I'm using the normalizer method from the preprocessing module of the SQLN library. And then I'm initializing it just as I have done for the upper, uh, for the standard scalar, the max scalar, sorry. And then I'm using the fit transform because it's a scikit led. And then I'm plotting just as we did for the last one. And then this is what we have for the original data. And then this is what we have for the normalized data. Forgive the shape, but this is, this, this, this mean, I mean, this shows that this data is normally distributed because it revolves around the mean. I mean, a lot of the data revolves around the mean, the mean and the median is the same. These are some of the assumptions that a normal distribution should have. The mean and the median should be close or should be the same. Uh, most of the value should, res uh, should resonate around the um, mean. Uh, it should have a bell-shaped or a Gaussian kind of distribution and the rest, okay? So as you can see, this looks something close. If it's not, you would see some other um, Gaussian distribution that comes like this. I wish I can read. But that is what it looks like. Uh, any questions for normalization? It's not much. We have already talked about scaling and then it's similar to normalization. The, the difference is a normalization, it reduces the, the, the data here we were having zero to, I mean, zero, 1,500, now we have 0.6, 1.4. We're having uh, uh, this kind of uh, data point in our data. Now we don't have that because it has been normalized. And uh, that is that, okay? So any question on normalization as well before we move on? I guess no question. So, because we have passed that already. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, yes. When, when yeah. we know when we normalize our data, it's like uh, we will have a normal distribution, like a bell shape, yeah? Yes, that's what we should get. Yeah, so uh, in here, I have, I'm have i seeing like rectangular shape. Uh, does that have a reason? Like we, we get this one? Uh, that's the way the uh, the data is. So for instance, if like, if I generate um, a new data and not this original data, it probably will have a, uh, a bell shape. And most cases when you use, um, um, normalization uh, method, you are supposed to get a bell shape, but in, in some key, uh, scenarios, you might not get the bell shape, or you have something close to it. Okay, and that's what we have here. So it's not like all data will go and, you know, form a bell shape form when you apply a normalization method to it, but you have something close to it. Okay, and then that is why, that is one of the reasons why if you remove the outlier before you normalize the data or you scale the data, you might have a, a good result uh, compared to when you don't remove the outlier and then you just scale or you normalize. Okay? Okay, okay. Thank you. What's my big problem? Normalize my data. Uh, you know, it's the same problem that will occur when you don't scale your data, will occur when you don't normalize your data. Right? It's just like it will assign weights to where weight is not due. And then you don't want that, and that's why we just normalize and we skip. But yeah, as you know, data scientists are like an iterative process, so you can like build a model without normalizing, and then you come back and then you normalize depending on your result. Yes, scale helps us to do the extreme Yeah. What type of data do we normalize? We normalize um, uh, uh, numbers, numerical uh, kind of data. So if it's like, uh, if it's, if it's like um, a salary, we can normalize kind of that kind of data. If it's like measurement, say temperature, 
we can decide to normalize that too as well. Okay. Any other questions? Have I answered the questions or is it not clear? Hi, good morning. Yes. When I met, when I asked her what type of data do you normalize, I really don't get why we know like I understand the scaling, like how I just I understand the scaling part for the normalizing. I don't really understand the import bounds and where to normalize and oh. why we need to normalize. Okay. All right. Let me let me go over it again. Um, more time. Uh, so as you know, scaling changes the range of our data, but normalization is a radical transformation. So the point of normalization is to change your observations so that they can be described as a normal distribution. So that is just it. Here we have a data that is not normalized, but it is scaled. Here the our model will like be weights where it is due and then to not like misappropriate or misassign weight so um but for for um normalization we we are normalizing so that our data has uh, 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 a uh, a gaussian kind of distribution that is it is evenly distributed basically that is why we normalize we, if you scale and then you don't normalize that is fine it is like if i'm to choose it is better you like scale and then leave um, normalized and normalizing your data because what normalization will do is just like it to make your data have a normal distribution. So if your data does not have a normal distribution before, it will just try and bring it to a normal distribution. So if, for instance, here we have a lot of our data that is decided between zero to uh, 250 because the data is not evenly distributed. So when we normalize it, it's, it's supposed to then evenly distribute our data and then it should distribute it around the mean. And when that happens, we have the bell shaped uh, kind of data. Okay? So if you scale your data, then you need to normalize it. Okay? Okay. okay. Uh, that is that for transformation, scaling, and normalization. Yeah. So now we are just checking the data type using the info method. It's not new, I believe. So we have some of this column, and then the the point here is we have the age, and then the age says it's object. As you know, age is not supposed to be object, even though and uh, there are some that will still argue that age is object because it's categorical, because you can either be one, two, three, four, five, six, and if yes, you can be 10.2 years, even though you can. So I have, we have the formula called um, fixed age, which which is which takes in the age column. What it does is it replaces. Let me I save it. Okay, I think I can. Okay, so this is what the age column looks like. Okay, and that is why it is um, object. So we need to like fix this before because we need to get a clean data out of this before we then move on to the next. Yes. So for us to fix it, we are using this, and then we are replacing um, all the opening square brackets with empty and then all the closing parentheses with empty and then we are replacing all the missing value with empty as well and that's what we get for weight this is just um they were assigning it should just be h so choose it for h okay that's the first stage so here we'll get a data that looks something like this okay we get the data that looks something like this. We get 0 to 10, 10 to 20, and the rest. This is still um object data type. Yeah. So we need to like fix that. And then that's what this new line is. This line here is doing. Line three. New age is, is another list. And then what it is doing is, is we are looping through age, this one here, and then we are saying we are splitting it by this. We are getting the um second value and first value as you know if we split this for instance sure this is not going to anybody i'm just going to, try to explain it uh to do the splits and then we do this we we'll get an uh, a list of two elements zero and ten so this is a zero this is ten i'm sorry this is zero index zero and then this is index one yeah and that is what we are doing here index zero, index one. We are adding both of them, and then we are dividing 
multiplying by two, which means we are getting the average of that particular age grid. And that is what we are storing in age, and that's what we are storing in our uh, fixed age column. And then we are getting the 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 age, the age which is like the group. So we can like do some analysis on that, and that's how we are getting it. We might not use it in our model analysis, but if we have all of this column, and then we go into the modeling part, we can decide what we want to use and how we want to use them. We the type to have them already, and that's why everything is in the same uh, function. That's what we are doing. This this returns an error, but it works. I think. Uh, and uh, we have a diag one, diag two, diag three from the initial look of the data. Where is that? Diag. Yeah. So from the initial look of the data, this is supposed to be a uh, numerical column. But looking at the info, we got object. Okay. And then we want to fix this. And that is why we are using this. So while I was trying to fix this, I noticed that there, there was some um, text string kind of uh, values in it. And then we have to like um, coerce it, which is like replace them or remove them to, to zero. I can't really remember what the coerce does. But it's automatically changed everything in this column to a numerical uh, data type. And then when we check the, the info again, they have been converted to what they need to be. OK. All right. There's a lot of explanation that goes on in pd.numeric. I would advise you to go and um, to read it, to read it up. OK. That is that. And then the last part to discuss before we call it a day is some utility functions that are written for you. So you can use it in the analysis. This particular function is called missing values table. It takes in the data frame and then it gives you the it gives you a data frame yeah, that will let you know which column has missing values, the percentage of missing values, and then the data type. Okay, so it's an utility function, it's very helpful. It's that, and then there is a format float which um, helps you set the uh other okay, this the display part of your uh, notebook. So if you are dealing with a lot of uh, values, let's say exponential six, so uh, pandas will automatically um, truncate that. And then for you to have like control over it and then see the entire value, you can use uh, for mass load. I'll show you a code on how to do this in a bit. Yeah, this is the code. So this particular line will help you um, set the formats to look nice. And then you'll be able to like read it and then understand what is going on instead of reading the truncated uh, file. Okay. That's the format flow. And then we have the find aggregate. You are going to use this function a lot in your task one and the uh, and task two, a little bit of task two. So here I intentionally don't put uh, didn't add a doc string so that you figure what the function is doing. Basically, it will accept a data frame and then an add column and then an add metric, and then a cool name, the top, and then the order, a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, let me run through this. So it's the, you know, data from the group by, group by uh, a categorical column, so to say, and then you select the column that you want to aggregate on, and then you're using the add uh, method, then you pass in which of the add method you want to aggregate with, and as you know, it has to be string, do not forget, and then uh, you are resetting the index so that you get a data frame out of it. And then when you do that, you are renaming the you are renaming the column to be whatever column name is. And then uh, you are uh, say you are sorting the values by the new column name that you have defined here. The sending is your choice, but it's by default false. And then you can decide to get the top twenty, top fifty, your choice. And this is what uh, it will return a data frame for you. And then you'll be able to like, answer the question that has been asked for it, uh, of it. For instance, uh, let's see, where is it? Is it six? Yes. Oh, cool. Is it? So, for instance, yes, for task, uh, okay, for task 1.1, you are asked to aggregate um, 
per user the following this so number of xdr session you would have seen that in the future description so you you probably know how to like use the add and um, find add method to get this to return the data frame straight up for you. that's why i've written it hopefully you'll be able to make it work okay but this code will work if you pass in what is required yeah and then there is the um, convert bytes to megabytes which basically takes in a byte data and then returns a megabyte uh, data in the form of a series you're going to use this and that's true yes. and uh, the last part is we are mapping this is not mean we are mapping the we're mapping some values in a particular column to their yeah, value as we want so we say no is no greater than 30 is yes less than 30 is yes basically what it is is readmitted we have the readmitted column here here and then what it means is where they um where the uh patients readmitted if they were not says no and then this is like counting oh they were readmitted greater than 30 times so more than 30 times and then less than 30 times so but, but generally what it's saying is yes they were readmitted and then that's why we are mapping it to this and we're using this function to do that and uh, that is all for data cleaning transforming and uh, extraction do you have any questions A lot of questions. Uh, what should we do? And does it make sense? I did that transform such if you transform them into numbers, they'll probably be in the same scale, so you can you can still decide to um, scale them. But it's not compulsory if they are already in the scale at which all of your data is. The religious reason why we scale is because we have some values that are extremely high compared to other values, and then we need to bring them to the same level, and that's why we scale. Okay, and the state of scale and data my F of speed prediction. Yeah, so um, if you have if you build a model and uh, you did not scale your data, you can like go back and then try to build the model and then scale it. In most cases, it should improve your model when you scale the data some data are just like um very stubborn and even when you scale them they will still not like improve and if you do not scale them they'll still just work the way they're expected to work okay so you can like try both method and see which one is working for your own case because you know we have different data and then we have different kind of problem uh can you repeat the app function okay i'll do that um just let me try to do that okay thank you Eliphas. Uh, yes we deliberately did not include it so that it not confuse you as to which one you're supposed to use. So this is just for tutorial purposes. And then you do not need to like run the code to get it, just like make a copy so that you see the output and then you can compare and contrast. Okay. Okay, let me go back to the arc function and then we explain it and then we'll call it the data. Which, uh, so it's the find arc, you mean? It will group by the column that you specify. This column can be most, I think it should be a categorical column, okay? That is present in the data frame that you have passed. And then you are selecting the column that you want to aggregate by. You know, the question here is taken. Okay, you know, the. Okay, so the question here says, you should aggregate per user the following information in the column. So you want to aggregate the number of XDR session. If you look at the uh, data, if you look at the uh, data, you have a column that uniquely identify a particular user. So that's what you group by. So you are grouping by per user. And then XDR session, you have a column that says this user has this kind of session. And then you want to put in your XDR session here. And then you want to say add, and then they said the question says the uh, number of XDR session is so number of XDR session that could be uh, count or I think it's count or so boy it's count so you're gonna like add put count here that would be an XDR no socket and then we are resetting the index so that we get a we get a data frame 
and then we are renaming it to the cool name that we want so you can call this one uh, count of xdr session yes and then you are sorting by that count of xdr session in whichever fashion you like other i mean descending or ascending and then you can get like the top 20 top 50 depending on what the question asks okay and then this will return the data from for you i hope you understand now. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, but well, uh, Vincent, do you like understand? Oh, Michael, you are raising your hand. Do you have questions? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the fix yeah. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Michael, go ahead. Yes, um, uh, the fixed age function. Yes, fixed age. Please, can you go over it for me? Okay, we are way past our time. Hello. All right. Hi, do you have questions? Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay, and just answer um, Michael's question and then I'll come back to your question. Okay. You can like type it if you might forget. Thank you. It's not like it. All right. Okay. So what the, what it is doing is we are looping the colon. Okay. And then we are filling the missing value. Or we are, it's not really neat. So we are looping the colon. Uh, the iterator is called X. We are replacing the opening square brackets with an empty um, uh, empty string. And then we are replacing the closing parentheses with an empty string because that is what we have in our data okay that is the case here so it's just like i understand this is the problem and then this is how i want to fix it and that's what i have done okay so instead of using like a uh so instead of using like a, a for loop and then do this one line to the other the next line so i'm just like using the uh, one line uh, kind of thing to um solve it and then this this age will be categorical what we'll get is similar to this so we'll get something like this Okay, but then that is not what we want. So we go one step ahead, one step further, and then we say we are still looping the age, this new one here. We are looping it. So what we'll get is, is 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 30 to 40. When we do that, that's like an A string. Because it's a string, we can apply the split method, and then we are splitting by the uh, hyphen line, hyphen character. And then when we do that, we will get something like this, okay? So if we get something like this, this is index zero, this is index one, and that is what we are targeting here, index zero, index one. I am converting them to integer because they are integer. So I'm converting it to integer and then I'm adding this one plus this one, and then I'm getting the average. And that is what the result of this is what I'm storing in new age, and that's what I'm returning here. Do you understand? Yes, I think it's clear. Uh, so in effect, you are just cleaning the data and then putting, you are cleaning the data for the age. Yes, I think that's it's, All right, thanks. You're welcome. Um, Robert, yes, that is correct. That is correct. So it, it depends on like how you understand it and how you want your um, data to be. You, we can leave it as a categorical column and then you know do the mapping to convert it to integer before we build the model. But I just feel we can do a lot more than just leaving that, that. Or we can have a lot of these data points available and we can use from some other analysis or try and building the model with it and see how it works. Okay. All right. Um, someone was going to ask a question. That's uh, can you give us a clarification? Final gate does how does it? Um, I have explained final gate points. I think you should have like get the idea. But generally, what it does is is groups. It takes in where is it again? It takes in a categorical column. It groups by that on this data frame. All uh, of the columns excuse, are your specific. Excuse yes? me, Mr. Mubakar. I think the, the the issue is uh, maybe when you're explaining, move your cursor on what you're talking about so that it can be clearer. Uh, the way Vincent was saying. Okay. Thank you. I can I'll do that. All right, let me just explain this one last time. Oh, 
if you're not in for it. Uh, so find aggregate, this is what I'm explaining now, yeah? What it does is it has set a data frame and then the add column, like the aggregate um, column, is the categorical column that you want to group by. And then I use an example of the question that was asked in class 1.1. And then the add metric is the, the, uh, the, the, add, uh, the add function that you want to aggregate with. So the add metric can be a count, a sum, or uh, a mean or median. Can you please mute yourself? And then we have the code name, which is what you are uh, renaming the column to be, which is like the result of your um, group bar. And then we have the top, which says uh, how many uh, how many of the uh, columns that you want to return, I mean, how many of the rows that you want to return. And then we have the order, which is like how you want to order it. Okay? Guys, is this clear enough? Very clear. So, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Oops. And then uh, that is that is that about this um, session. If you have any questions, look at the data exploit. So we have two data in the uh, folder that has been shared with you. Here. So we have the week one and then week, uh, week one. All this data is the same thing. This one is uh, XLSX, the Excel kind of format data, and then this one is the CSV. So depending on whichever one that you are able to open first, we've provided a um, reference on how to open Excel file if you like have difficulty opening them. And then we have the PD.CSV, which would like help you to uh, import the data. Okay. And then if you have any questions, this is like a simple way for you to like import it. Just the engine is supposed to open. Excel, but before you do that, you have to like keep install. Um, you have to like do keep install. Um, open Py Excel to do that. Okay. So thank you very much, um, guys. And then we have um, any other questions? Please let us know on Rocket Chat, and then we we'll do our best to help you. All right. Uh, keep coding. Keep doing amazing. We'll talk soon. Cheers, everyone. Hello. Ah, oui, ça Mais je te veux mon